again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous tele uh, telephone program, this program that has been especially designed to uh, focus our energy and thinking and attention on a book, that book that most important book, the Bible, the Bible which is so available in the world and yet is so little read and certainly even less likely obeyed, yet it is the law of God for the human race, for you and for me. Yes, the Bible is that personal. It's not just a book for a generic book for the whole human race. It is, but it also is a book for you and for me. God is addressing each of us as we read the Bible, and we better listen, listen carefully. And isn't it wonderful that we can have a program like this where we can spend an hour and a half just talking together about what we read in the Bible. In fact, that's my role as a host of this program is simply to keep our eyes focused into the scriptures. But this is your program and we want to hear from you, so shall we take our first call tonight, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh my, we uh, don't have our telephones together here yet. Uh, this is a program where we uh, would like to hear from you. Now, the fact is that we do encourage people to call only once a month, only once a month, uh, because if you call more often than that, it, 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 there are many trying to get through and they be, and they're not able to get through because uh, so so many people are trying to get through, but so please uh, uh, do not call more than once a month. But shall we take our first call tonight, please? Good evening, welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Wel welcome to Open Forum. Brother Canting. Yes. Uh, good evening, Brother Canting. Yes, so go since, ahead with your call. So since we're a few weeks away from Christmas, may, may I first wish you and your family a very blessed Christmas. Well, thank you. And in the Gospels, it said, Jesus said, um, Let your light shine before men that they might see your good works. My question is, what are the good works, and how can unsaved men see the good works if they're spiritually dead? Well, the, they, the, first of all, what are the good works? Any time we obey the Bible, that is a good work. The work, our work, is to be obedient. Uh, it begins with trusting, and that is also a good work. Just trusting in Christ as our Savior and Lord. Now, uh, people may not, with, as they see us living. They may not recognize what we're doing as good works, but they certainly see what we're doing. They can see that we are trusting altogether in the Bible. They, they hear us, or they see this in action if they know us at all very well. Uh, they can see how we react to certain situations, that we are very patient, uh, that we walk very humbly, that we do not carry uh, uh, animosities, that uh, and that we have a desire that others might hear the gospel. Now, it doesn't mean that they will recognize uh, every good work that we do, but uh, they will see us in action. Uh, that can't, they can't help but uh, see that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, good. Uh, the ninth chapter of Romans. Romans and, 9, yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Which verse are you looking at? Um, verse 25, 26, and 27. Verse 25, we read... 
uh, as he, as he says to Hosea, I will call them call them my people, which were not my people, and and they, they, there they shall be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also. Well, let me let me uh, you know, excuse me. I let me read that again. I didn't do that very well. Let let me start again. As he said also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Now, what is your question? Um, uh, could you expound upon that a little? I would like to know exactly what's being said. Uh, well, the, the the point is, is that God has a salvation plan, a salvation plan. Now, in a, in a, in a, a Romans chapter nine, God is uh, emphasizing that that salvation plan is based on God's elective program. He said, "I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy." He said that uh, um, uh, that. Uh, 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 he, he has chosen uh, the ones that he planned to save before they were even born, and, and he used uh, he used Jacob and Esau as an illustration of this. Who were these were twin brothers, and he then is proceeding to develop the fact that that number of people who do become saved uh, will be his people. And and even though they start out not being beloved, they will become beloved, and and they will be called the children of the living God, and uh, and that remnant will be uh, as the uh, uh, will uh, will come forth from Israel. That is, uh, as the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. That is, there is a remnant of all those who hear the gospel who do become saved. Uh, Twenty-three. Uh, the uh, the. Could you read that one and, and What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of of uh, wrath fitted to destruction, and that and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath the poor prepared unto glory. What God is saying here is that God is in charge of the whole human race. And uh, there are those whom God did not plan to save, and uh, they are under the wrath of God, and they are uh, uh, there not because of God's hatred of them in the first instance, but because they have rebelled against God, and they've earned the hatred of God. And as God uh, uh, carries out his... Uh, his uh, a judgmental decree upon them that is as he uh, carries out what he has declared that the wages of sin is death as he carries that out in their lives so that they end up in hell that also praises God because it indicates that God is absolutely true to all of his commitments and promises uh, and on the other hand it also illustrates the enormous punishment that Christ had to endure on the on behalf of those who do become the people of God, because they Christ equivalently had to bear that same wrath uh, that comes against the unsaved. Uh, he has to bear that wrath on behalf of those who do become saved, and and uh, so the the whole program of salvation, both the fact that there are those who. God did not plan to save, as well as those whom God did plan to save, and then had to bear the wrath of God in order that they might become saved. Everything about it ultimately brings praise and glory to God, because it is all carried out with perfection, 
uh, and and with great uh, uh, great honor and so on. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Brother Campbell. Yes. I'm a first-time caller. I have two questions, and I'll take it off the air. There were a time when God came into the world as a person for a short time. Yeah, excuse me. I would you turn your radio off, please? Would you please turn your radio off? And then go ahead with your call. Hello? Yes. When God came for a short time... What Bible, what part of the Bible was that? So what, what verse was this? What, what kind of a God is which? He came into the world as a short time as a person. Yeah. Well, why did he do that? He had, do you see, a God what, plan to save a certain number of people, that is to make payment for their sins in order that he might claim them for himself to be with him eternally in heaven and in order uh, to pay for their sins it meant that someone uh, a fellow human of, uh, had to uh, who was qualified had to make that payment and so since there was no one else available God himself did it he was capable of uh, so enduring uh, the uh, intensity and the awfulness of the wrath of God in the space of a short time so that it would become equivalent to these individuals that Christ came to save spending an eternity in hell and Christ had to do that and then once that was done and he instituted that whole salvation plan by doing that and uh, and uh, immediately following that uh, God began to e to evangelize the whole world so that people from all over the world began to become saved. Then Christ went back to heaven. He had done his work here. But thank you for calling and sharing that question. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Campin. Yes. Um, I'd like to say a few things. Uh, first of all, regarding the the, um, the Christmas holidays, I don't understand how Family Radio um, play all the Christmas music if they say that Christ is born in October, and it, to celebrate that part. Okay, that's just one of the things I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say is about the Seventh Day Sabbath. They say that's done away with, and it said it's been changed. How are we to believe that the Seventh Day Sabbath has been changed because of Mark 28, where you said that? King James made a mistake. If he made a mistake in one part of the Bible, how are we to believe anything else that King, King James said? Oh, well, uh, you asked a very good question. Uh, the fact is that a translation is not inspired by God. A translation and the uh, the uh, original uh, uh, the original Bible was in uh, in Hebrew mainly in the Old Testament and in the Greek language in the New Testament, that was divinely inspired. It, we never, never question that. But when we look at any translation, we know that, that that's, it is possible that it has errors in it. And that's why a good Bible teacher will go uh, check, check not only with the English or the Spanish or the Russian or the Chinese Bible he's reading, but he will also check the original or the uh, yes the Bible in the Hebrew language and in, uh, and in the New Testament in the Greek language to check on the translators. Now normally we find that in the English language the King James translators did a quite an acceptable job. It's not very often that we find a verse that could have been better translated. But once in a great while, there will be a verse, or more than one verse, and this is true of the, when they were translating the word Sabbath in the New Testament, they did not do an acceptable job. Now, why God allowed that, that I don't know. That's another matter uh, that God only knows. But we do know 
that we can make the necessary correction. And that does not invalidate the rest of the King James Bible. Uh, oh. It simply indicates, well, in this one error area, there was an, an error made. Okay, well, they see, usually I know that God said to keep the Sabbath day as a perpetual covenant between me and thee. Now, the t out of his Ten Commandments, you're saying that there's one commandment that changed out of all the commandments that we shouldn't keep no more that's changed to the Sunday. But yet, when God told us to circumcise our heart, we knew that that was going to change, whereas we wasn't no more going to have the flesh circumcision but the heart circumcision. Because well, he kept telling us that throughout the scriptures, but never ever has he told us throughout the scriptures to change Sabbath day from a Saturday to a Sunday. Well, excuse me, excuse me. I, I, no, one is, uh, no one is teaching that we would change a law of the Bible. We would never do that. The fourth commandment still stands that we are to, uh, where it speaks there about keeping the Sabbath. And remember in Deuteronomy 5, why do you think it says in Deuteronomy 5, you are to keep the seventh day Sabbath? Uh, uh, because I have brought you out of Egypt with a high hand. Now, what does that have to do with the seventh day Sabbath? Have you ever thought about that? Thought and about why do you think it says in Exodus chapter 31? That, uh, that where God said that I, I have given you the Sabbath as a sign that I, the Lord, sanctify thee. Your problem is, is that in the church you belong to, they have picked and chose certain verses of the Bible uh, that they have learned very well. And based on those verses... They have arrived at a series of doctrines, and these. And if you belong to the Seventh Day Adventist Church, I don't. Uh, well, it, many people do. If you do belong there, then it's even. Uh, uh, they even have a further evidence that they're on the right track because they're listening to the visions of one of their church founders, Ellen uh, um, uh, G. White, and uh, which obviously could never have come from God at all. And so uh, they're not listening to the whole Bible. And, but when we, take, when we begin to listen to the whole Bible, and that's why I asked you about Deuteronomy 5. Right, well, and, I asked, and I asked you about Exodus 31. And why did, they, did God say in Colossians chapter 2 that the Sabbaths and the new moons and the, and the laws concerning meat and drink, which were all ceremonial laws, were a shadow of things to come, a shadow of things to come. A shadow has no substance. Okay. And so all of that has to be taken into account. More than okay. that, when you look at the Greek of Matthew 28, it, sa it says, in the end of the Sabbaths, as, that is, there was an era of Sabbaths that have come to an end as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath, same word, indicating a new era had begun on that Sunday morning. Now, you've never been taught that, these things, and but they're all right from the Bible. Please check all these things out first very, very carefully. And then you'll... Then you'll I begin to learn that there's a lot that you haven't haven't taken into account when you talk about the seventh day Sabbath. I'm just going to ask one more one other thing on that question, then I'll take it off the air. Because on Genesis, it's a like six days has thou thou created he created earth in six days and he rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. He sanctified that seventh day for some some reason, not the first day of the week, but the seventh day of the week. So that's kind of like got me confused. I, I don't mind worshiping on the first day if I'm supposed to worship, or even in addition to yeah, worship well, on the first day. Excuse me. Excuse me. See, what you have done is you have taken one scripture, and you have built your theological case from that, that that, that is the scripture that stands. And everybody does that. That is coming up with wrong doctrine. They find a scripture. They find a verse here and a verse there and a verse the other place. And uh, based on those verses, they arrive at a conclusion and they are convinced we have the truth. It says here, right here in the Bible. But there's a biblical rule 
Namely, we are to compare spiritual things with spiritual. And, and that simply means that until you have taken into account everything in the Bible that speaks to this uh, to the Sabbath day and, and harmonized it all, you have not come to truth as yet, whatever your conclusion may be. And, 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 you, and if you're going to be honest, you know full well you have not thoroughly investigated all these other verses that I'm talking about. And, and that's the first thing to do. And after you have carefully harmonized all of those verses and, 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 and understand why God sp says about what God says about them in connection with the Sabbath day, well, then let's talk again. You're going to find out. You have, a, a, if, you, if you've done it carefully, you found, found out that the Seventh-day Sabbath was something entirely different than what you thought it was. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good, Good evening. evening. Yes. Yes. Good evening. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Go ahead with your call. Yes, I would like you to hear Jeremiah 17, verse 20 to 27. Could you explain that for me, please? Now, let me look at that now. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. 20 to 27. 20. Verse 20 to 27. 20 to 27. Jeremiah 20, 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 20. Yes, and, and read it to 27. Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah and, of, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. Is that the passage? Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work, for hallow, but hallow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. Now you see this is talking about the fact that the, the word burden, if we analyze that in the Bible, is the word uh, uh, gospel or law of God. And the idea is that, that and, and to go into the gates of the city is a spiritual representing coming into salvation or coming into the kingdom of God. Uh, we go through the gate. The gate is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And we're to try to get into the kingdom of God. But it says, don't carry a burden. That is, don't come in by try, trying to keep the law. And that's exactly what people do today. They say, oh, well, we have to... We, uh, we have to... Uh, 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 the basis of our salvation is that we keep the law of God, that we are doing it uh, by uh, by being a good person, and, and that includes also keeping the seventh day Sabbath. That's part of the law of God. And God says, "Don't carry a burden in on the Sabbath day." Uh, uh, that is, we don't get into the kingdom of God by keeping the law. We get into the kingdom of God by the by the uh, gracious mercy of God, the free gift of salvation. But thank you for calling and sharing. Thank you, too. Yeah. And but. shall we take our next call? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Camping? Yes. Uh, yes, I had uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is Philippians 129. Philippians 129. Let's look at that. Philippians 1. 29, there we read, and in nothing terrified by your no, adversaries. No, that's not it. That's not it. That's 28. 29. For unto you is given. Is that it? Yeah. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, what is your question? 
my question, uh, my, my second question refers to this. Uh, John 3.16 um, and uh, Philippians 1.29, uh, I believe that Philippians 1.29, it clarifies that it's, a, it's been granted unto you to believe on him. It's a gift of faith that he gives in his own time compared to John 3.16 on whomsoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I believe that people are misled and uh, are being taught wrong because Philippians 1.29 clearly states it's been granted unto you that he gives the faith, that he sustains the faith. If it was man conjured up with uh, John 3.16 uh, to confess with your mouth, uh, then it would be man sustained. I, I think you've got to uh, mix a, a valid point all together. Here God is saying, for uh, in for Philippians one twenty nine, for unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him. It is given not only to believe on Him. Now, however, uh, those who would contend against this would would argue, and, and it's possible uh, to make this argument. In other words, we there, we have to look at a lot more verses to know for sure that. Faith is a gift of God altogether, and there are many other reasons why it is a gift, because they could argue, well, now, wait a minute, it is given unto you on behalf of Christ uh, uh, not only to believe on him, uh, uh, indicating that you've already believed on him, but it is given unto you to suffer for his sake, and, and they, may, uh, they may argue that... Uh, that it's not quite as solid and quite as substantive as you and I would like to say it is. But uh, the fact is that we know there's a countless verses like we are dead in our sins, we're a valley of dry bones, and, uh, and all kinds of other things of that nature that indicates that Christ had to do all the work of saving. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to open forum. Mr. Camden? Yes. Okay. A blessed good night to you, and I just want to ask you to break down Matthew, 12, Matthew 11 and verse 12 for me, please. Matthew 11 and Discuss verse 12. Yes. Let's take a look at that. Matthew 11 verse 12 there we read uh, and from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force is that the verse yes yeah well that 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 question or that verse is answered by uh, John chapter 6 verse 15 John chapter 6 verse 15 you see the nation of Israel of that day were looking for a Messiah they were looking for a Messiah who would uh, be a political king who would free them from Roman rule very much as the premillennialists of our day are looking for a Messiah who's going to come up come and set up a throne in Jerusalem and reign a thousand years it's really the same kind of an idea and so here is Jesus on the scene and he is uh, he is obviously a, a some kind of an absolutely special person as he does all these miracles and and uh, feeding the masses and so on surely he must be the Messiah and they can't wait to uh, to make him their political king and set up the program uh, to uh, free them from Roman rule. So we read in John chapter 6 verse 15, when Jesus there perceived that they would come and take him by force, that is viol violently take him, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Because Christ, of course, did not come as a political king. He did not come 
to set up a, 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 a political kingdom of some kind in this world. It was totally a spiritual kingdom that had to do with the new heaven and the new earth. And thank you for sharing that question. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Uh, could you uh, uh, elaborate on Isaiah 43, verse 25, please? Isaiah 43, verse 25. Let's look at that a moment. Isaiah 43, verse 25. I, even I, uh, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Is that the verse? Yes. Yeah, that's a very beautiful verse that is really emphasizing that it is God. God is speaking, I, even I, uh, and again, and he is uh, speaking of himself as Jehovah back in verse 15. He says, I am Lord, that is, I am Jehovah, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. And now he's adding, I, in verse 25, I am he that blotteth out your transgressions. Now, how did he do that? He did that by making the payment uh, demanded by the law of God uh, that was required because of our transgressions. And and uh, and uh, it, it was all done for God's own sake. That it was that is God wanted to show His power. God wanted to show His love, His uh, mercy, His uh, all of His attributes that shine through in all of this. And and once He has blotted out our transgressions, they are remembered no more. They will never, never be thrown up to us. Look what you used to do. Look how you sinned. No, they're remembered no more. And that's because uh, it is only because of his grace. and his Only justice. because of his grace. And grace, the definition, the biblical definition, definition of grace is really the free gift of salvation. The fact that God gave to those that he planned to save the gift of salvation, saving them from the wrath of God and making them his children. And that's all has to do with the coming of uh, Christmas. Well, it's that's, our, that's, it was our gift. Well, that's what, the, that's what Christmas is all about, because our uh, Christmas is centered on Christ. It should be if we're going to celebrate it with any sincerity at all, although we're not called to celebrate it. But if we do, uh, we want to focus on Christ and not on Santa Claus or somebody else. Well, I hope uh, you receive your best gift, Jesus, through, uh, through this holiday season. Well, we certainly uh, are, you know, as we, the purpose of family radio existing is that people might come to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they'll only do so as they hear the Bible, as they read the Bible, as God and if God, as God in His own good time applies the Word of God to those that He plans to save, and that's simply what the whole program of Family Radio is. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Brother Camping, have a super fine Christmas season. Thank you, and shall we go to our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, I'm calling from New York. Uh, yeah. I have a uh, 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 question. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I'm wondering, uh, Jesus went up into heaven in a human in a human body, and perhaps uh, uh, do his people go up in heaven uh, in a humanly body? Well, the, here, here's the situation. Uh, uh, you're, uh, you've asked a very interesting question. Uh, back in uh, several thousand years ago, a great many thousand years ago, there was a man by the name of Enoch. We read about him in Genesis chapter 5. 
I believe, and uh, and he, when he was 365 years old, he was not because God took him. And so he was the first man that was brought from this earth into heaven in a human body. Now, he would not be in heaven in his present body. He would have to be in heaven in his glorified spiritual body, which is far more glorious than his earthly body. Uh, before Enoch, uh, men like Abel, uh, who was a child of God, and others who would have been children of God, uh, they, when they died in their spirit essence or in their soul existence, uh, when they died, they went into heaven to be with Christ. But here comes Enoch. He comes uh, into heaven in a human body. Then a little bit, some thousands of years later, uh, here appears Elijah in heaven in a human body. Oh, yes, even ahead of him came, uh, came uh, uh, Moses. Moses is in heaven in a human body. Then, uh, then the next one who appears in heaven in a human body, again, it would have to be a glorified spiritual body, is Christ himself be, uh, uh, when he uh, ascended into heaven. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, ahead of that, there were the, uh, the uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 27, it talks about when, when uh, Christ, uh, uh, when Christ um, uh, rose from the grave, uh, the grave, the, just ahead of that, the graves were opened uh, in and around uh, the Mount of Olives there, and uh, the, lo the bodies of uh, many of the of the believers who perhaps had been buried hundreds of years before, their bodies were caught up to be with Christ in heaven. So now we have Enoch, we have Moses, we have Elijah, we have a number of people who ascended up into heaven at the moment that Christ arose from the grave, and then uh, uh, 40 days later Christ himself as in heaven in a glorified spiritual body where he remains in a glorified spiritual body uh, throughout eternity future and uh, there's not another human being however going into heaven in a glorified spiritual body until a few years from now we're going to get the last day of the history of this world and Christ is going to appear on the clouds of glory and every true believer that has ever lived on the face of the earth except for these that are already with him in their human body in their glorified spiritual body all the rest of the believers will also be with him in a glorified spiritual body forevermore in the, but and they will we'll live with him in the new heaven and the new earth yes i have a, a point of view <laughs> It's about the people that call uh, uh, about uh, uh, enrolling in the uh, armed forces and going to war. And uh, I've noticed uh, from my little experience, I've noticed that in the Bible, every time that God sent the people to fight, it, it was when uh, it went, went well with them. Uh, but in other times that God did not tell, send them to, uh, to fight, uh, they lost or, or it didn't go well with them. And, and I, I was wondering, uh, uh, these people go to war nowadays, in our days, uh, did God tell them to fight or did God tell them to love each other? Or, well, uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, when we, we find Abraham, for example, went to rescue Lot, and, he, and we read about him, he returned from the slaughter of the kings when he rescued Lot. Now, there was nothing improper about that. We find that David killed Goliath. He was he that was uh, that is he came he went to war against the Philistines. Uh, we read about Samuel hacking uh, King Agag together because God had commanded that Agag was to be killed. Uh, he was a prophet. And we find Elijah on the Mount of Carmel, uh, and the 450 prophets of Baal are killed. Uh, and all of these things were done. Uh, in accordance with God's plan and because they were pictures of the fact that God brings judgment upon the unsaved of the world. But on the other hand, there of course were 
there's a record in the Bible of many wars that were not, to, not or many much killing that was not at all pleasing to God. We have to look at each each record and check the context and to understand just what spiritually it is that God is teaching. Now, insofar as war today is concerned, we do know from uh, Romans chapter 13 that God assigns the task of government to uh, the heads of each nation. In other words, each nation has a divine mandate to rule over the nation. And uh, they, uh, there is nothing in the Bible that says they should not have a police force or a, uh, an army. Uh, they, uh, their task, among other things, is to protect the citizenry. And so at times they may have to go to war. Uh, they don't get a mandate directly from God. There's no voice that they hear. There's no vision that they receive. Uh, it is simply that in their actions as uh, rulers of that, of that nation, they believe that uh, they must do this fighting uh, to uh, protect their nation and sometimes it's uh, it's uh, it's valid and it's maybe a lot of times it's not valid but insofar as individual believers are concerned they too can be a part of a of, they can be soldiers or they can be policemen and that is they can be have a task that occasionally may require them to kill a human being uh, as they are assisting in the protection of the citizenry. And uh, that's, that's just the way God has designed the laws of the land. Yes, I have another point of view. Uh, it's about marriage. And yeah. uh, uh, Jesus said that uh, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And uh, I believe that uh, God, uh, God joined together Jesus and the bride, uh, the eternal church or something. But uh, the other is, like uh, me and perhaps my would-be wife, uh, we're not going together by God. So uh, so uh, to this marriage, uh, man puts asunder uh, 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 this marriage. In and, other and words. The, the marriage of God... Uh, God between God and uh, Jesus and, and the, the bride of Christ, uh, no man can, can put that asunder. Well, in other because, words, uh, excuse me, what you are concluding is, is that uh, there are a few people in the world who were married by Christ, that is, God brought a man and a woman together and it became a Christian marriage of some kind, and all the other people of the world are all living in adultery, it's not a marriage that Christ has arranged at all or has part in. They are simply shacking up together. They're living together without any true marriage. Now, that just is not true. The fact is, God goes back to Genesis. Uh, he says, from the beginning, it was not so. Uh, mankind, uh, the first marriage was Adam and Eve. And they represented the whole human race. We were all in them. God established the marriage union then. And anybody who gets married, regardless of whether they know anything about the Bible or not, regardless of, uh, of uh, how wicked they may be or whatever, or how casual the marriage is, if it's in agreement with the laws of the land, uh, whom God uh, do has has uh, uh, appointed to be the uh, the government, uh, the ruling body over uh, the citizenry of that land. It is a marriage that God has uh, has ordained and is to be looked at a marriage as a marriage. And so you can try to figure out a way to justify divorce, but it won't wash if you're going to be faithful to the whole Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Campion. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. I have a couple of questions for you. A um, couple of weeks ago, a lady called and asked you 
uh, when God created Adam, did he literally create him out of clay? Did he mold him out of the dirt of the ground and breathe life into him? But you never gave a clear answer. You, you kind of told her that we have some of the elements of the earth itself, but she was looking for a little answer. Well, you it, see... Uh, physically mold mud. Yeah. And well, literally breathe life into it. That's what she was trying to get a clear answer for. Yeah, you see, the... The uh, this is the the picture that God is is painting that He formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, and we have a mental picture, therefore, of God molding a form of a human being out of some uh, clay, uh, and then giving that that uh, clay uh, um, uh, form that he has formed uh, the breath of life and it becomes a living person but we don't have to think of it that way at all this is remember we have to look at language in the Bible and look for its spiritual meaning when he formed man out of the dust of the earth God is indicating and and as we search the Bible uh, as to how all that ties together, we find it simply means that we uh, we we started out. We have all the same elements as the as the dust of the earth. We return to the dust of the earth, and and but it's not describing. In fact, in fact, if we read the the the, the uh, creation account, it says, and God said let there be light and God said and let, and God said in other words God was not forming uh, physically molding uh, this or that or the other thing he was simply speaking and these things came into existence and that would have had to have been true of man also okay, my second question uh, would you say that God created all the angels perfectly we have to know that he created all the angels perfect because God is God. God, there is no sin in God. There is, uh, everything is perfect about God. Now, the fact that some of the angels rebelled, that's a mystery to us, just as the fact that mankind rebelled is a mystery. But they, but he did not, uh, he did not create them with the, with sin within them, or the seeds of sin of any kind, that uh, that would not have comported, uh, would not agree with a perfect God. Okay, my final question. Um, many times you say that um, um, a believer, a true believer, will not commit suicide. But uh, my question is: Did God send aware in the Bible that He will not give us more than we can bear? And secondly. If a person is a true believer and does commit suicide, would that in fact mean that God gave that person more than they could physically bear? Well, no. The, here's, here's the, first of all, I've never said that a true believer absolutely cannot commit suicide. I, would, I said that usually we don't, would not, uh, that would not happen because a true believer is not thinking in those terms. Uh, uh, normally suicides are developed or, uh, because people become very depressed and they begin to uh, have those kind of thoughts and those thoughts fester and develop and grow and, and it's a vicious circle so they become more depressed and finally they take their life. But a true believer's mind is not going to be going in that direction. However, uh, let's suppose that here is a true believer and in a moment of depression and in a situation where it would be <laughs> instantly easy to to uh, 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 commit a suicidal act, act for example you're walking across a bridge and this uh, this uh, true believer now he's a truly a saved person and it's he's not he's feeling very depressed and and uh, uh, and suddenly he throws himself over the rail and the moment that he throws himself over he knows oh what am I doing what a terrible thing but he, he's on his way down to hit the bottom and he's going to be dead and so he's committed suicide 
Now that, remember, if he, we're setting up the illustration of a true believer, it means that all of his sins had been paid for. It would be no different uh, than, for example, here is a true believer who is uh, uh, who normally is a very calm person and normally does not become angry or anything, and yet uh, now he's quite elderly. He's got uh, a lot of uh, health pains and so on, and he had a real bad night of sleep, and his heart is very, very weak, and and everything is all uh, uh, falling apart, and yet he's a true believer. He, he dearly loves the Lord, but this morning he is exceptionally angry. It's a very unusual thing in his life, but it can happen, and because in his anger his blood pressure goes up and he gets an instant heart attack, and he's dead. All right. Now it was a result of a direct sin, but whether it was suicide or that that instant heart attack, uh, it, it, those sins too had been covered by the Lord Jesus Christ. That does not impact that person's salvation. Even though these illustrations I'm offering are exceedingly uh, uh, rare, they're they're. Uh, they're, they're not th not things that we would er would expect to see uh, readily at all amongst true believers. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. This is Jimmy the Weed Zender calling from Geneva on the Lake, Ohio. Hey, uh, Mr. Camping, I was uh, looking at the verse that refers to uh, as as the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Yes. Okay. I was looking at this, and, uh, you know, I know how you always say that, hey, we're, we're ready, we're ready, and we know when he's coming and this and that. But, uh, the, you know, the truth of the matter is, Mr. Camp, he came as a thief in the night a long time ago, and he stole the church. And that's why you can't find any, any prophets anywhere. Well, I... Mr. Camping, okay, you know, okay, you know how he says, I come as a thief in the night, okay? How does a thief in the night dress? In dark? Well, excuse, in dark color? Uh, uh, excuse me, I... Uh, 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 the, the Bible is speaking here. Uh, let's read First Thessalonians 5 again, so we'll get the language of the Bible in front of us here. In First Thessalonians chapter 5, there, he, uh, there God speaks of Christ coming as a thief in the night. He says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord... Now, normally when God is talking about the day of the Lord, he's talking about judgment day, the, the, the day that ends the world. Now, it's true that judgment began already with the uh, end of the church age. Uh, that's when God, Christ did come spiritually as the judge to make, start making the arrangements for this day of the Lord. But here in 1 Thessalonians 5, it particularly addresses the, uh, the judgment day itself. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Now, the fact that Christ is come spiritually to begin to judge the churches that is not sudden that's been going on now for several years uh, and, and and then he uses the phrase as travail upon a woman with child and that's a figure that God uses in several places in the Bible to indicate that moment when the child is born when uh, the the uh, uh, and that is a particular moment in time and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. And it goes on to say that we uh, watch and uh, and so on. But uh, and therefore we do not. We he does not come as a thief for us. 
but I don't think we can we uh, have any reason to say that Christ has already come. Yet, yes, in a sense, he has come as a thief in the night, in the sense that he's already brought judgment in the churches. But uh, but we freely talk about that. And uh, and uh, 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 but when Christ comes on in the day of the Lord, we won't be talking about it. It'll, it'll, he'll be here. It'll be the end. Mr. Camping. Yes. Okay. This is the thing, okay? He always taught in parables, okay? You have to look into the dark places of the poetry, you see? Excuse me. He Hold on. I'll be right back places. with you right after this message. Hold on. We're talking to someone about this matter, about Jesus coming as a thief in the night. Let me just develop this a little more in Matthew 24, where God uh, indicates that Christ will come as a thief in the night. And he says, For as in the days were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, uh, uh, and just ahead of that, God has said, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then he goes on, uh, Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. This is not talking about what's going on today, as Christ is pre preparing the churches for judgment. Uh, that judgment has begun in the, in the churches. This is talking about when Christ returns, when we see him on the clouds of glory, two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what God is speaking of when he is said he is coming as a thief in the night. Camping. Yes. Okay, have you ever heard of Johnny Cash? Well, yes. Have you ever heard of Bob Dylan? Well, I've, I'm not very familiar with those names, but what is your point? These guys are fantastic teachers. These guys teach in parables. They teach at night, just like at the end of after the church age. God comes as a thief in the night, like a poet in the night, speaking in the parables, in the lyrics. Oh, excuse they me. Excuse me. No, 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 no. You're way... Uh, you're way outside of the Bible. Uh, you're way outside of the Bible. We have to read the Bible, and we find our answers in the Bible. And uh, the Bible is not poetry. Oh, there is some poetry in the Bible, but every word in the Bible is carefully crafted by God, and we have to compare Scripture with Scripture. Uh, that's why when we see the phrase, for example, that... Uh, they, Christ will come uh, like a woman, uh, like a woman in travail. We have to search the Bible to find what that means. When we see the word darkness, we have to search the Bible to see what that means. We can't get any lessons from lessons from Johnny Cash or Bob Dylan or anybody else out there. We have to get our lessons just from the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Brother Camping. Yes. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. Yes. The Those come after salvation. And number 7, would you look what the seventh fruit of the Spirit is, please? Yes. Light, love, joy, peace, long suffering, meekness. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Verse 22 uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Faith, yes. All right, that's a, a fruit of the Spirit. Comes uh, after salvation. It comes after, it is, um, yes, after salvation, of it, course. It, it's a work of Christ. That those, uh, those who claim that. Uh, that uh, God first gives us faith, and then through that faith we trust in the Lord, they will say, they will agree with us that, uh, yes, but he also develops, further develops that faith as a fruit of the Spirit. So that, again, is not a conclusive statement, although it's a correct 
conclusion that you're making that faith is a result of the fact that God has saved us. Okay, I heard something a while ago I wasn't quite clear on uh, St. John chapter 3, verse 13. I got part of your answer, but I needed to know about the, I believe it was Matthew 28, that some entered heaven after death. Well, thank you so much for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, how are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. Um, uh, Psalm 37, verse 9, please. I have Psalm 37, verse 9. Let's look at that. 37, verse 9. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Is that the um, I, I know there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. Uh, after after this earth is destroyed and new heavens and new earth are created, where um, are the believers going to be living uh, in the new heavens and new earth or just in heaven only? The, the Bible teaches that, uh, let, let's go to Second the, the, uh, Second Peter, Chapter three that that helps us to understand this a little bit more in uh, second Peter chapter three, we read in verse ten, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away. There again is a reference to the day of the Lord identifying with right at the end. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And then it goes on in verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. That is, the whole universe is, uh, is being destroyed, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. In other words, as it were, uh, God doesn't use this uh, language, but it's as it as if out of the ashes of this present universe, God br- brings into being a brand new universe in which heaven and earth are one. Presently, you know, Christ is up there in heaven. When we die in our spirit essence, we leave this earth and we go up there to be with Christ, wherever that is. We don't know where that is at all. That's in a different dimension, a different uh, frame of uh, thinking altogether. We, our mind, our human minds can't understand that. But, uh, but, and we're down here on this on this planet Earth. But but when God uh, is finished with this universe, it'll all be destroyed instantly, and God is going to recreate a new universe. But now it will not be Christ up there and man down here. We will be living with him in that new heaven and new earth. It'll be one place. It, there, there will be no separation anymore by the great expanse uh, that we have right now. Thank you very much, and uh, you have a good night, and, and take care of yourself. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Good evening. Yes. Um, I want to find out from you, how do I know that I have sinned? Uh, secondly, what? I want you to interpret these two verses for me from the Bible. Exodus... Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Let's look at that. Exodus 12, verse 13 and 14. 13 and, 14. and um, I want to give it to the two chapters, the two verses. Well, let me, first that, direct, let, let me read these two verses, and then we'll look at the next verse. Okay. Is it the verse that says, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over no, you. I said Ecclesiastes. I'm sorry? 
Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Oh, oh, you're talking about Ecclesiastes? Yes. Oh, excuse me, I was looking at Exodus. Well, that's some difference. Let me go back to Ecclesiastes. Um, Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12, 12, verse 13 and 14. These very, very important verses. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Uh, okay, another verse is um, First John 3, verse 24. 1 John, John. Ch- chapter 3, verse 24. Yeah. All right, let's look at that. First John chapter 3, verse 24. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. Uh, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Okay, can you explain those two books? Well, yeah, first of all, back in Ecclesiastes, God is indicating the predicament that mankind is in. And that is that God has uh, expects mankind, because they were created in the image of God, to keep all of his laws, all of his commandments, and the whole Bible is a... Uh, is, a, is the law book that sets forth all the commandments that we are to keep. And this is God's expectation for man. And if we don't, if we break any of those laws, we're going to come into judgment, for God shall bring every work into judgment. And if, if, uh, if, if there's any sin that is found, and sin is a transgression of God's law, it will, it will cause, it will force God to impose the penalty demanded by the law of God, eternal damnation. In other words, the predicament of man is terrible. It's, it's terrible because we're all sinners, and therefore automatically, unless something happens, uh, uh, unless God intervenes in some way, uh, we're going to end up at, in, at the judgment throne. Now, in 1 John chapter 3, uh, God uh, tells, talks about those who begin to keep his commandments. Now, first of all, in order, uh, in order to begin to keep his commandments, we have to become a new creature. And uh, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, that which is born of God does not sin. Now, uh, it, we are not born of God as a whole personality immediately. We are, it really uh, happens to us in two stages. First of all, in our soul uh, or our spirit essence, which is an integral part of our personality, we're made a new creature in which at the moment God saves us so that there is no more sin within the, our soul. We, uh, we do not want to sin anymore, even though we have to live in a body for the rest of our natural life, we, that is, until we die physically. We have to live in this body which still has not become saved and still lusts after sin. But because in our soul we are no longer sinning of any kind that we we don't we don't want to sin and and uh, we are we are troubled when when we do fall into a sin that caused by our sinful body uh, but uh, but uh, God no longer has any wrath upon us and every sin that we still commit in our body that also has been paid for so that God looks at us as if we have not commit, are not committing any sins at all. And, uh, and, of course, when we receive our glorified spiritual body on the last day, when Christ returns, uh, then 
uh, then as a whole personality, we will never, 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 never sin again. And now, uh, here he's declaring in First John chapter 3, Hereby we know that he abideth in us, and that's what, that is uh, what happens when we receive our brand new resurrected soul. Not only does he make us, give us a new soul uh, when we become saved, but God himself indwells us in, 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 as God the Holy Spirit. And how he does that, I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that we will find in our life an intense desire to do the will of God. We'll find a love for the Word of God, a delight in the Word of God. And uh, we, if we uh, understand that we are holding some doctrine or some practice, that is not faithful to the Word of God, we're troubled because we want to be as obedient as possible to the Word of God. And this gives us assurance that we become a child of God. When we find that ongoing desire is there and, and uh, we're uh, happiest when we're doing the will of God, uh, that can really uh, encourage us that we God must have saved me because otherwise I would never be living this way. Um, thank you, Father. Final note, um, I want to ask, quickly ask, is the law and the commandment relevant in a Christian, in a Christian life today? Well, it, it is wonderful that this is the way, you know, we read also in, uh, in uh, Romans 8, uh, Romans 8, uh, 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 a similar promise in verse uh, 16 in uh, in uh, verse yes in verse 16 of Romans 8 the spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and that witness comes through the word of God the Bible is the sword of the spirit and the more we read the Bible uh, and ponder it if we are truly a child of God we, and we find in our life a real appreciation for the Word of God, and we're, we, uh, we find that uh, that really is our desire as we look at ourselves very honestly, that we do want to do the will of God, and, and if we fall into sin, we are deeply troubled by it, uh, then we have that assurance, I am a child of God. We can know that now. So the comments are still relevant today. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Praise the Lord, Brother Camping. Um, I just wanted to, to inform you about the trip that my friend and I took to uh, Taiwan and China. Yes. Uh, we were really blessed, and I just couldn't help uh, sharing with people about uh, Genesis chapter 7, chapter 9, ele uh, verse 11, verses Second uh, Peter chapter 3, you know, um, you know, encouraging people to look into the Word and uh, wait on the Lord. Um, and uh, there is something that I would like to uh, talk to you, but I would rather call you up. Uh, at the station uh, another time. Um, another thing I would like to uh, uh, you to read is uh, Matthew 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 8. Matthew 19, verse 8. Yeah. Uh, and what is to, your, uh, uh, there we read, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. Okay, so uh, he did, the Lord, I heard you uh, repeatedly say the Lord uh, uses his word uh, very carefully, um, such as this one, though, that um, he said from the beginning. He didn't say in the beginning because in the beginning it could be one way, and the, in the end it could be the opposite, right? Well, so, you see, we have said from to, the beginning. That means it's continuous, right? Uh, no. Well, uh, no. It's like not since, in, since the could it could it also mean since the beginning? 
you see, the fact is, we, when we look at any law of God, and God, Christ here is spelling out his laws, mm -hmm. we have to look at every statement in the Bible that relates to the statement that we're presently looking at. And, uh, and God, Christ is indicating that right from the beginning, uh, it was one man, one woman. There were not to be divorced. There just were not to be divorced. And uh, that, that's the way uh, it was from the beginning. But then remember that God set up this temporary uh, uh, arrangement in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, and that also became an integral part of the law of God, that... Uh, that you could put away your wife, a man could divorce his wife if there was some uncleanness in her, uh, that is some fornication, and uh, and uh, so that was that was uh, uh, the law of God. But now Christ is uh, indicating that that Deuteronomy 24 one law is has been abrogated; it has been set aside. And going back to the way it was from the beginning, uh, that there is not to be divorce, even though temporarily uh, the law of God did allow a man to divorce his wife for fornication. But verse 9, uh, when I'm looking at the Greek, it says not based on fornication. So my understanding is, I believe he's saying it doesn't matter, that's not the matter whether the woman fornicate or not, there is no excuse if a man who is married and went to marry another. Well, uh, uh, you know, the fact is that he, in verse 8, uh, verse 7 and 8, the matter of fornication has been discussed when, they, when the Jews reminded Jesus of the law of Moses. That mm -hmm. has to do with fornication. Mm -hmm. And in and, and Matthew 5, Christ clarified that, yes, that did mean a man could put away his wife for fornication. Now, yeah. in verse 9, Christ is going back to the original statement. Is it right? In verse 3, is it right for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And now Jesus is going to summarize it and answer that and say, if not for fornication, we've already talked about fornication. You're not to put away your wife for fornication. And if, you're, if not for fornication, for any other reason, there is not to be divorce. And yeah, now, we have a, now we have a complete statement. Yeah, because some pastors or some, some people, believers, they, you know, they see this uh, phrase, not based on fornication. If not for fornication, they thought that was the excuse. That was the reason, the uh, uh, well, uh, thank le you. legal uh, excuse. But uh, I believe what he is saying is that's not the issue. That's you know the, the fornication is not the issue as long as he is married. He, sh he shouldn't be marrying another. And then in Matthew five, he, you know he says uh, to give them a, a, a letter, a certificate of divorce was the uh, the old time that, um, you know, uh, can you read chapter yeah, well, 5, verse 31? Me. Uh, excuse me. Matthew 5 is simply reiterating or straightening out the Jewish thinking in connection with Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. They believe that that word uncleanness had to do with ceremonial uncleanness, and that allowed them to divorce almost at any time they wish because any time their wife had a discharge from her body she was ceremonially unclean look at verse 10 of Matthew 19 His, uh, when Christ got finished uh, to emphasize you cannot divorce for any reason whatsoever his disciples say unto him if the case of the man be so with his wife it is not good uh, to marry so Matthew 5 is simply uh, correcting the Jewish thinking about the understanding of Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. It is not setting it aside, that particular law, but Matthew 19 is setting that law aside and indicating there's not to be divorced for any reason. I'm not saying that uh, it's being set aside in chapter 5, uh, verse 31 and 32. I believe what he's saying is 
it's not that simple. You just give a, a certificate of divorce and that's it. And it's not that simple. It's more serious than that. Yeah. That a man is accountable to his wife's fornication in later on, unless the wife already fornicated, you know, then yeah. he, he couldn't be accountable. But I, I believe what he's saying, it's not that simple just to give a, a paper, just present a paper and that's it, you know. I believe well, he's thank, saying... Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And shall we go to our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping. Yes. How you doing? Very well, thank you. I want to tell you, you are one of the brightest and most intellectual, thoughtful, caring persons in this world. And I just wanted to tell you, you are a genius, and God loves you, and everything you say is going to come true. Well, excuse me, let me ask you, what is your question? This is not a program to adulate anyone. This is simply... <laughs> What is my a, a question? Program, a program to get into the scriptures, and, and please, uh, we better get off the, this trend of, of speaking. Uh, uh, okay, what is my question, Mr. Camping? Yes. Okay. Um, in what verse does it say that Jesus will return in a certain year, that he will come back? Well, there is no verse in the Bible that says, in the year such and such, Christ will return. Uh, this <coughs> this <coughs> is, a, is information that we can arrive at or get very uh, likely get a, the truth about by very carefully looking at a whole lot of evidence in the Bible. To begin with, why did God put in the Bible sufficient information so that we can develop a very accurate calendar of history beginning right at the beginning. And in that calendar of history, be able to know the precise years of very important milestones uh, along that, uh, the unfolding of that calendar of history, such milestones as the time of the flood and the time when Abraham arrived in the land of Canaan and the year that uh, Isaac was born, uh, the year that Jacob went into the land of Egypt, the year that uh, Israel went out of the land of Egypt, the year that David ascended the throne, the year that Jesus was born, the year that Jesus was crucified. Why do we have all of that information so carefully? Is set forth in the Bible so that we can develop a very, very accurate calendar of the past. Was that just uh, kind of curious or kind of interesting? And the answer is no. It is in order that we can advance it right up till the end and know something about the very end of time. But I've, uh, with that, I have to say good night because we've come to the end of our time.